just are. Misery, like yoga, is not a competitive sport. But I have found over the years that by reading about other people who have suffered, survived, and overcome despair, I have felt comforted. It has given me hope. I hope this book can do the same. Falling. I can remember the day the old me died. It started with a thought. Something was going wrong. That was the start, before I realised what it was. And then, a second or so later, there was a strange sensation inside my head, some biological activity in the rear of my skull, not far above my neck, the cerebellum. A pulsing or intense flickering, as though a butterfly was trapped inside. I did not yet know of the strange physical effects depression and anxiety would create. I just thought I was about to die. And then my heart started to go. And then I started to go. I sank fast, falling into a new claustrophobic and suffocating reality. And it would be way over a year before I would feel anything like even half normal again. Up until that point, I'd had no real understanding or awareness of depression, except that I knew my mum had suffered from it for a little while after I was born, and that my great-grandmother had ended up killing herself. So I suppose there had been a family history, but it hadn't been a history I'd thought about much. Anyway, I was 24 years old. I was living in Ibiza. It was September. Within a fortnight, I would have to return to London and reality. After six years of student life and summer jobs, I'd put off being an adult for as long as I could, and it had loomed like a cloud, a cloud that was now breaking and raining down on me. The weirdest thing about a mind is that you can have the most intense things going on in there, but no one else can see them. The world shrugs. Your pupils might dilate, you may sound incoherent, your skin might shine with sweat, but there was no way anyone seeing me in that villa could have known what I was feeling. No way they could have appreciated the strange hell I was living through. Or why death seemed such a phenomenally good idea. I stayed in bed for three days, but I didn't sleep. My girlfriend Andrea came in with water at regular intervals, or fruit which I could hardly eat. The window was open to let fresh air in, but the room was still and hot. I can remember being stunned that I was still alive. I wanted to be dead. No, that's not quite right. I didn't want to be dead. I just didn't want to be alive. There were infinitely more people who had never been alive. I wanted to be one of those people, that old classic wish to never have been born to have been one of the 300 million sperm that hadn't made it. I remembered worrying about my younger sister, Phoebe. She was in Australia. I worried that she, my closest genetic match, would feel like this. I wanted to speak to her, but knew I couldn't. When we were little, at home in Nottinghamshire, we had developed a bedtime communication system of knocking on the wall between our rooms. I now knocked on the mattress, imagining she could hear me all the way through the world. Knock, knock, knock. On the third day, I left the room and I left the villa and I went outside to kill myself. Why depression is hard to understand? It is invisible. It is the wrong word. The word depression makes me think of a flat tyre, something punctured and unmoving. Maybe depression minus anxiety feels like that, but depression laced with terror is not something flat or still. The poet Melissa Broder once tweeted, What idiot called it depression, and not there are bats living in my chest and they take up a lot of room, P.S. I see a shadow. You can be a depressive and be happy just as you can be a sober alcoholic. It doesn't always have an obvious cause. It is mysterious, even to those who suffer from it. The sun was beating hard, 
The air smelt of pine and the sea. The sea was right there, just below the cliff, and the cliff edge was only a few steps away. No more than twenty. The only plan I had was to take twenty-one steps in that direction. There was a lizard near my feet, a real lizard. I felt a kind of judgment. Lizards are survivors. You take off their tail, and another grows back. They aren't mopers. They don't get depressed. They just get on with it, however harsh and inhospitable the landscape. I wanted more than anything to be that lizard. The villa was behind me, the nicest place I had ever lived. In front of me, the sparkling Mediterranean, looking like a turquoise tablecloth scattered with tiny diamonds. And yet, the most beautiful view in the world could not stop me from wanting to kill myself. I was going to do it as well, while my girlfriend was in the villa, oblivious, thinking that I just needed some air. I walked, counting my steps, then losing count, my mind all over the place. I made it to the edge of the cliff. I could stop feeling this way simply by taking another step. It was so preposterously easy—a single step. Versus the pain of being alive. Now listen, if you have ever believed a depressive wants to be happy, you are wrong. They could not care less about the luxury of happiness. They just want to feel an absence of pain, to escape a mind on fire where thoughts blaze and smoke like old possessions lost to arson. To be normal, or as normal as impossible, to be empty. And the only way I could be empty was to stop living. One minus one is zero. But actually, it wasn't easy. The weird thing about depression is that, even though you might have more suicidal thoughts, the fear of death remains the same. The only difference is that the pain of life has rapidly increased. So when you hear about someone killing themselves, it's important to know that death wasn't any less scary for them. It wasn't a choice in the moral sense. To be moralistic about it is to misunderstand. I stood there for a while, summoning the courage to die, and then summoning the courage to live, to be, not to be. An ounce more terror, and the scales would have tipped. There may be a universe in which I took that step, but it isn't this one. I had a mother and a father and a sister and a girlfriend. That was four people right there who loved me. I wished like mad in that moment that I had no one at all. Love was trapping me here, and they didn't know what it was like, what my head was like. Maybe if they were in my head for ten minutes, they'd be like, "Oh, okay, yes, actually, you should jump." But that was not how it worked. If you are depressed, your pain is invisible. I think life always provides reasons to not die, if we listen hard enough. Those reasons can stem from the past, the people who raised us, maybe, or friends, or lovers, or from the future, the possibilities we would be switching off. And so I kept living. I turned back towards the villa, and ended up throwing up from the stress of it all. A conversation across time. Part one. Then me. I want to die. Now me. Well, you aren't going to. That is terrible. No, it is wonderful. Trust me. I just can't cope with the pain. I know, but you're going to have to, and it will be worth it. Why? Is everything perfect in the future? No, of course not. Life is never perfect, and I still get depressed from time to time. But I'm at a better place. The pain is never as bad. I found out who I am. I'm happy right now. I am happy. The storm ends. I can't believe you. Why? You were from the future, and I have no future. I just told you. I had gone days without proper food. Andrea told me I needed to eat. She went to the fridge and got out a carton of Don Simon Gaspacho. 
In Spain, they sell it like fruit juice. Drink this, she said, unscrewing the cap and handing it over. I took a sip. The moment I tasted it was the moment I realised how hungry I was, so I swallowed some more. I'd probably had half the carton before I had to go outside and throw up again. Oh, God, she said. We're going now. Where? I said. To the medical centre. They'll make me take pills, I said. I can't take pills. Matt, you need pills. You're beyond the point at which not taking pills is an option. Medication didn't work for me. I think I was partly to blame. In Bad Science, Ben Goldacre points out that you are a placebo responder. Your body plays tricks on your mind. You cannot be trusted. This is true, and it can surely work both ways. During that very worst time, when depression coexisted with full-on 24-7 panic disorder, I was scared of everything. I was quite literally scared of my shadow. But the thing I was most scared of was drugs or anything, even a massage, that would change my state of mind. It is a strange irony that it was during the period when I most needed my mind to feel better that I didn't want to actively interfere with my mind. Not because I didn't want to be well again, but because I didn't really believe feeling well again was possible, or far less possible than feeling worse. And worse was terrifying. So I think part of the problem was that a reverse placebo effect was going on. I would take diazepam and instantly panic, and the panic increased the moment I felt the drug have any effect at all, even if it was a good effect. Months later, a similar thing would happen when I started taking St. John's wort. It would even happen to a degree with ibuprofen. The only drugs I ever took that seemed to make me feel a bit better were sleeping pills. The sleeping tablets enabled me to function enough to go home. They didn't help me sleep, but they helped me be awake without feeling total terror. I can remember our last day in Spain. I was now sitting at the table, saying nothing, as Andrew explained to the people we were working for and technically living with, Andy and Dawn, that we were going home. Andy and Dawn were good people, I liked them. They were a few years older than me and Andrea, but they were always easy to be around. They ran the largest party in Ibiza, Manumission, which had begun as a small night in Manchester's gay village a few years before and morphed into a kind of Studio 54 in the Med. By 1999, it was the epicentre of club culture, a magnet for the likes of Kate Moss, Jade Jagger, Irvin Welsh, Fatboy Slim and thousands of European clubbers. It had once seemed like heaven, but now the idea of all that music and all those party people seemed like a nightmare. But Andy and Dawn didn't want Andrea to leave. Why don't you stay here? Matt will be okay. He looks fine. He's not fine, Andrea answered them. He's ill. He doesn't look ill. Dawn still had glitter on her face from wherever she had been the night before. The glitter troubled me. I'm sorry, I said weakly, wishing for a more visible illness. Guilt smashed me like a hammer. I took another sleeping pill and then my afternoon dose of diazepam, and we went to the airport. The party was over. If you are feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 2 Matt has landed back home from his fateful trip to Ibiza, but he continues to spiral. My mum and dad were at the airport. They stood there looking tired and happy and worried all at once. We hugged, 
we drove back. I was better. I had left my demons behind in the Mediterranean, and now I was fine. I was still on sleeping pills and diazepam, but I didn't need them. I just needed home. Yes, I was still a little bit edgy, but I was better. I was better. Mum turned around in the passenger seat and looked at me and smiled, and the smile had a slightly crumpled quality. Her eyes glazed with tears. I felt it, the weight of Mum, the weight of being a son that had gone wrong, the weight of being loved, the weight of being a hope that hadn't happened in the way it should have. But I was better, a little bit frayed, but that was understandable. I could still be the hope. I could be a lawyer or a brain surgeon or a mountaineer or a theatre director yet. It was early days. It was night outside the window. Newark 24. Newark was where I had grown up and where I was going back to. A market town of 40,000 people. It was a place I had only ever wanted to escape. But now I was going back. I thought of my childhood. I thought of happy and unhappy days at school, and the continual battle for self-esteem. Twenty-four. I was twenty-four. The road sign seemed to be a statement from fate. Newark twenty-four. We knew this would happen. All that was missing was my name. I remember we had a meal around the kitchen table. I think it was a fish pie. I think they had made it especially. Comfort food. It made me feel good. I was sitting around the table eating fish pie. It was half past ten. I went to the downstairs toilet and pulled the light on with a string. The downstairs bathroom was a kind of dark pink. I pissed, I flushed, and I began to notice my mind was changing. There was a kind of clouding, a shifting of psychological light. I was better. I was better. But it only takes a doubt. A drop of ink falls into a clear glass of water and clouds the whole thing. So the moment after I realised I wasn't perfectly well was the moment I realised I was still very ill indeed. The next day I woke up and it was there the depression and anxiety, both together. I felt like I was trapped in a cyclone. Outwardly, to others, I would, over the next few months, look a bit slower than normal, a bit more lethargic, but the experience going on in my mind was always relentlessly and oppressively fast. These were some of the other things I felt. Like my reflection showed another person, a kind of near-aching, tingling sensation in my arms, hands, chest, throat, and at the back of my head. An inability to even contemplate the future. Scared of going mad, of being sectioned, of being put in a padded cell in a straitjacket. Hypochondria, separation anxiety, agoraphobia, a continual sense of heavy dread, mental exhaustion, physical exhaustion, like I was useless, the occasional inability to speak, clammy, an increased sexual imagination, fear of death often seems to counterbalance itself with thoughts of sex, a sense of being disconnected, an urge to be someone else, anyone else, loss of appetite, I lost two stone in six months, like I was breathing too thin air, insomnia, the need to continuously scan for warning signs that I was A, going to die, or B, go mad, finding such warning signs and believing them. At the time, these experiences felt so weird, I thought I was the only person in the history of the world to have ever had them. I'd often involuntarily visualised my mind as a kind of vast and dark machine, like something out of a steampunk graphic novel full of pipes and pedals and hydraulics emitting sparks and steam and noise. Adding anxiety to depression is a bit like adding cocaine to alcohol. It presses fast forward on the whole experience. If you have depression on its own, your mind sinks into a swamp and loses momentum. But with anxiety in the cocktail, the swamp is still a swamp. 
but the swamp now has whirlpools in it. The illness that you have isn't the illness of a single body part, something you can think outside of. If you have a bad back, you can say, my back is killing me, and there'll be a kind of separation between the pain and the self. The pain is something other. It attacks and annoys and even eats away at the self, but it is still not the self. But with depression and anxiety, the pain isn't something you think about, because it is thought. When you are very depressed or anxious, unable to leave the house or the sofa, it can be unbearably hard. Bad days come in degrees. They are not all equally bad, and the really bad ones, though horrible to live through, are useful for later. You store them up, a bank of bad days. The day you had to run out of the supermarket, the day you were so depressed your tongue wouldn't move, the day you made your parents cry, the day you nearly threw yourself off a cliff. So if you are having another bad day, you can say, well, this feels bad, but there have been worse. And even when you can think of no worse day, when the one you are living is the very worst there has ever been, you at least know the bank exists and that you have made a deposit. I was in my parents' bedroom, on my own. Andrea was downstairs, I think. I was standing by the window with my head against the glass. It was one of those times when the depression was there on its own, uncoloured by anxiety. It was October, the saddest of months. My parents' street was a popular route into town, so there were a few people walking along the pavement. Some of those people I knew or recognised from my childhood, which had only officially ended six years before. Though maybe it hadn't ended at all. When you're at the lowest ebb, you imagine wrongly that no one else in the world has felt so bad. I prayed to be those people any of them, the 80-year-olds, the 8-year-olds, the women, the men, even their dogs. I craved to exist in their minds. I could not cope with the relentless self-torment any more than I could cope with my hand on a hot stove when I could see buckets of ice all around me. Just the sheer exhaustion of never being able to find mental comfort, of every positive thought reaching a cul-de-sac before it starts. I cried. I had never been one of those males who were scared of tears. I'd been a Cure fan, for God's sake. I'd been emo before it was a term, yet weirdly, depression didn't make me cry that often. I think it was the surreal nature of what I was feeling. The distance. Tears were a kind of language, and I felt all language was far away from me. I was beneath tears. But now they came, and not normal tears either, not the kind that start behind the eyes. No, these came from the deep. They seemed to come from my gut. The dam had burst, and once they came, they couldn't stop. Even when my dad walked into the bedroom, he looked at me, and he couldn't understand, even though it was all too familiar. My mum had suffered from postnatal depression. He came over to me and saw my face, and the tears were contagious. His eyes went pink and watery. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen him cry. He said nothing at first, but hugged me, and I felt loved, and I tried to gather as much of that love as I could. I needed all of it. I'm sorry. I think I said. Come on, he said softly. You can do this. Come on. You can pull yourself together, Matty. You're going to have to. My dad wasn't a tough dad. He was a gentle, caring, intelligent dad. But he still didn't have the magical ability to see inside my head. He was right, of course, and I wouldn't have wanted him to say much else, but he had no idea as to how hard that sounded. To pull myself together. No one did. From the outside, a person sees your physical form, 
sees that you are a unified mass of atoms and cells, yet inside you feel lost, disintegrated, spread across the universe amid infinite dark space. I'll try, Dad. I'll try. They were the words he wanted to hear, so I gave him them. And I returned to staring out at those ghosts of my childhood. Does mental illness just happen, or is it there all along? According to the World Health Organization, nearly half of all mental disorders are present in some form before the age of 14. When I became ill at 24, it felt like something terribly new and sudden. I had a pretty normal, ordinary childhood, but I never really felt very normal. Does anyone? I usually felt anxious. A typical memory would be me as a ten-year-old standing on the stairs and asking the babysitter if I could stay with her until my parents came back. I was crying. She was kind, she let me sit with her. I liked her a lot. She smelt of vanilla and wore baggy t-shirts. She was called Jenny, Jenny the babysitter who lived up the street. Do you think they'll be home soon? Yes, said Jenny patiently. Of course they will. They're only a mile away. That's not very far, you know. I knew. But I also knew they could have got mugged, or killed, or eaten by dogs. They weren't, of course. Very few Newark-on-Trent residents ended their Saturday night being eaten by dogs. They came home. But all my childhood I carried on this way, always inadvertently teaching myself how to be anxious. In a world where possibility is endless, the possibilities for pain and loss and permanent separation are also endless. So fear breeds imagination and vice versa, on and on until there is nothing left to do except go mad. Then something else. I was 13. Me and a friend went over to some girls in our year on the school field, sat down. One of the girls, one I fancied more than anything, looked at me and then made a disgusted face to her friends. Then she spoke words that I would remember 26 years later when I came to write them down in a book. She said, "Er, I don't want that sitting next to me, with his spider legs on his face. She went on to explain as the ground kept refusing to swallow me up what she meant. The hair growing out of his moles, it looks like spiders. That afternoon I went into the bathroom at home and used my dad's razor to shave the hairs off my moles. I looked at my face and hated it. I picked up my toothbrush and pressed it into my left cheek, right over my largest mole. I clenched my eyes shut and rubbed hard. I brushed and brushed until there was blood dripping into the sink, until my face was throbbing with heat and pain from the friction. That night I couldn't sleep. My left cheek throbbed beneath a giant plaster, but that wasn't the reason. I was thinking of school of explaining away the plaster. I was thinking of that other universe where I was dead, and where the girl would hear I was dead, and the guilt would make her cry. A suicidal thought, I suppose, but a comforting one. My childhood went by. I remained anxious. I felt like an outsider, with my left-wing middle-class parents in a right-wing working-class town. At sixteen, I got arrested for shoplifting, hair gel, crunchy bar, and spent an afternoon in a police cell. But that was a symptom of teen idiocy and wanting to fit in, not depression. I skateboarded badly, got eclectic grades, carried my virginity around like a medieval curse. Normal stuff. I didn't totally fit in. I kind of disintegrated around people and became what they wanted me to be. But paradoxically, I felt an intensity inside me all the time. I didn't know what it was, but it kept building, like water behind a dam. Later, when I was properly depressed and anxious, I saw the illness as an accumulation of all that thwarted intensity, a kind of breaking through as though if you find it hard enough to let yourself be free, yourself breaks in, flooding your mind 
in an attempt to drown all those failed half versions of you. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 3 Back at his parents' house, Matt still can't escape his depressive demons, but neither can he escape love. Landing A side effect of depression is sometimes to become obsessed with the functioning of your brain. During my breakdown, living back with my parents, I used to imagine reaching into my own skull and taking out the parts of it that were making me feel bad. From having spoken to other people with depression, this seems to be a common fantasy. But which parts would I have taken out? Would I take out a whole solid chunk, or something small and fluid? Once, during a dip, I sat on a bench in Park Square in Leeds. It was the sedate part of the city centre. Victorian townhouses now turned into legal offices. I stared at a cherry tree and felt flat. I could hardly move. Of course, Andrea was with me. I didn't tell her how bad I was feeling. I just sat there, looking at the pink blossom and the branches, wishing my thoughts could float away from my head as easily as the blossom floated from the tree. I started to cry, in public, wishing I was a cherry tree. The more you research the science of depression, the more you realise it is still more characterised by what we don't know than what we do. It is 90% mystery. A lot of the research into the scientific causes of depression has focused on chemicals such as dopamine and more often serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, that is a type of chemical that sends signals from one area of the brain to the other. The theory goes that an imbalance in serotonin levels caused by low brain cell production of serotonin equates to depression. So it is no surprise that some of the most common antidepressants from Prozac down are SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which raise the serotonin levels in your brain. However, the serotonin theory of depression looks a bit wobbly. The problem has been highlighted by the emergence of antidepressants that have no effect on serotonin, and some that do the exact opposite of an SSRI, namely selective serotonin reuptake enhancers, such as tianepatine, which have been shown to be as effective at treating depression. Add to this the fact that serotonin in an active living human brain is a hard thing to measure, and you have a very inconclusive picture. One thing can be said for sure, we are nowhere near the end of science, especially a baby science like neuroscience. So most of what we know now will be disproved or reassessed in the future. That is how science works, not through blind faith, but continual doubt. All we can do for the moment is really all we need to do. Listen to ourselves. When we are trying to get better, the only truth that matters is what works for us. If something works, we don't necessarily care why. Diazepam didn't work for me. Sleeping pills and St John's wort and homeopathy didn't fix me either. I've never tried Prozac because even the idea intensified my panic, so I don't know about that. But then I've never tried cognitive behavioural therapy either. If pills work for you, it doesn't really matter if this is to do with serotonin or another process or anything else. Keep taking them. Hell, if licking wallpaper does it for you, do that. I'm not anti-pill. I am pro anything that works, and I know pills do work for a lot of people. There may well come a time in the future where I take pills again. 
For now, I do what I know keeps me just about level. Exercise definitely helps me, as does yoga and absorbing myself in something or someone I love. So I keep doing these things. I suppose in the absence of universal certainties, we are our own best laboratory. The brain is the body. We tend to see the brain and the body as separate things. While in previous epochs, the heart was at the center of our being, or at least on an equal footing with the mind, now we have this strange separation where the mind is operating the rest of us, like a man inside a JCB digger. The whole idea of mental health as something separate to physical health can be misleading. So much of what you feel with anxiety and depression happens elsewhere. The heart palpitations, the aching limbs, the sweaty palms, the tingling sensations that often accompany anxiety, for instance, or the total body fatigue that sometimes becomes part of depression. During those breakdown months, as I'd later call them, there was a lot of empty time to stare worry in the face. My parents would get up and leave for work, and then me and Andrea would have long days in the house. It's weird to write about this period. I mean, really, there is nothing to write about. It was, from the outside, the least eventful phase of my life by quite a way. From the outside, it was me talking with Andrea, either in my childhood bedroom or downstairs in the kitchen. Occasionally, we would venture outside for a short walk in the afternoon. We would go either to the nearest corner shop, only about two or three hundred metres away, or, on more adventurous days, we would go and walk by the River Trent, which was a little further away on the other side of the town centre, and involve me walking through streets I knew so well from childhood. How could they stay the same when I felt so different? Sometimes we bought a newspaper and a tin of soup and some bread, and we would return and read a bit of the paper and make the soup. Later we might help prepare the evening meal, and that was about it. Talking and sitting and walking. It was hardly Lawrence of Arabia. Life at the lowest possible volume two 24-year-olds could manage. And yet, those days were the most intense I have lived. Those days contained thousands of tiny battles. They're filled with memories so painful I can only now, with a distance of fourteen and a half years, look at them head on. I was a nervous wreck. People say, take it one day at a time. But I used to think to myself, that is right for them to say. Days were mountains. A week was a trek across the Himalayas. You see, people say that time is relative. But it really bloody is. The only real thing I wished for, beyond feeling better, was for time to move quicker. I would want 9am to be 10am. I would want the morning to be the afternoon. I would want the 22nd of September to be the 23rd of September. I would want the light to be dark and the dark to be light. I still had the toy globe I'd had as a boy in my room. I sometimes used to stand there and spin it, wishing I was spinning the world deep into the next millennium. I was as obsessed with time as some people are about money. It was the only weapon I had. I would build up hours and minutes like pounds and pence. In my head, amid all the raging waters of anxiety, this knowledge buoyed like hope. It is October 3rd, 22 days since it happened. The longer that time went on, and I was still A, alive, and B, not mistaking anyone for a hat, the more I felt like there was a chance I could get through this. But it didn't always work like that. I stacked the days up like Jenga blocks, imagining I was making progress. And then, crash. Along would come a five-hour panic attack, or a day of total apocalyptic darkness, and those Jenga days would topple back down again. Warning signs are very hard with depression. It's especially hard for people with no direct experience of depression to know them when they see them. Partly this is because some people are confused about what depression actually is. We use depressed as a synonym for sad, which is fine, as we use starving as a synonym for hungry. Though the difference between depression and sadness is the difference between genuine starvation 
and feeling a bit peckish. Depression is an illness, yet it doesn't come with a rash or a cough. It is hard to see, as it is generally invisible. Even though it is a serious illness, it is also surprisingly hard for many sufferers to recognize it at first. Not because it doesn't feel bad, it does, but because that bad feeling seems unrecognizable or can be confused with other things. For instance, if you feel worthless, you might think, I feel worthless because I am worthless. It might be hard to see it as a symptom of an illness. Or even if it is seen as that, it's possible that low self-worth combined with fatigue might mean there is little will or ability to vocalize it. But in any case, these are some of the most frequently cited signs that someone is depressed. Fatigue, if someone is tired all the time for no reason. Low self-esteem, a hard one for others to spot, especially in those people who aren't that comfortable talking about their feelings. Psychomotor retardation. In certain cases of depression, slow movements and slow speech may happen. Loss of appetite, though massive increase in appetite can sometimes be a symptom too. Irritability, though, to be fair, that can be a sign of anything. Frequent crying episodes. Anhedonia. I first knew of this word as Woody Allen's original title for the film Annie Hall. It means the inability to experience pleasure in anything, even the pleasurable things like sunsets and nice food and watching dubious Chevy Chase comedies from the 80s. Sudden introversion. If someone seems quieter or more introverted than normal, it could mean they're depressed. I can remember there were times when I couldn't speak. It felt like I couldn't move my tongue, and talking seemed so utterly pointless just as the things other people talked about seem to belong to another world. Demons. The demon sat next to me in the back of the car. He was real and false all at once. Not a hallucination exactly, and not transparent like a theme park ghost, but there and not there. There when I closed my eyes, there even when I opened them again a kind of flickering mind print transferred over reality, but something imagined rather than seen. He was short, about three foot, impish and gray, like a gargoyle on a cathedral. And he was looking up at me, smiling. And then he got up on the seat and started licking my face. He had a long, dry tongue, and he kept on, lick, lick, lick. He didn't really scare me. I mean, fear was there, obviously. I was living continually inside fear. But the demon didn't send me deeper into terror. If anything, he was a comfort. The licks were caring licks, as if I was one big wound and he was trying to make me better. The car was heading to the Nottingham Theatre Royal. We were off to see Swan Lake. It was the production where all the swans were male. My mother was talking. Andrea was in the front passenger seat, listening with polite patience to my mother. I can't remember what she was saying, but I can remember she was talking because I kept on thinking, This is weird. Mum is talking about Matthew Bourne, and there is a happy demon on the back seat licking my face. The licking got a bit more annoying. I tried to switch the demon off, or the idea of the demon, but of course that made it worse. Lick, lick, lick. I couldn't really feel the tongue on my skin, but the idea of the demon licking my face was real enough for my brain to tingle, as if I was being tickled. The demon laughed. We went into the theater. Swans danced. I felt my heart speed up. The dark, the confinement, my mother holding my hand. It was all too much. This was it. Everything was over. Except, of course, it wasn't. I stayed in my seat. Anxiety and depression, that most common mental health cocktail, fuse together in weird ways. I would often close my eyes and see strange things. But now I feel like sometimes those things were only there because one of the things I was scared of was going mad. And if you are mad, then seeing things that aren't there is probably a symptom. 
if you are scared when there is nothing to be scared of, eventually your brain has to give you things. And so that classic expression, the only thing to fear is fear itself, becomes a kind of meaningless taunt, because fear is enough. It is a monster, in fact. And of course, monsters are real, Stephen King said, and ghosts are real too. They live inside us, and sometimes they win. It was dark. The house was silent, so we tried to be too. I love you, she whispered. I love you, I whispered back. We kissed. I felt demons watching us, gathering around us as we kissed and held each other. And slowly, in my mind, the demons retreated for a while. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 4 A seemingly simple trip to the shop leads to a vivid panic attack for Matt, but there are reasons to carry on living. Rising When I was most severely depressed, I had quite a vast collection of related mental illnesses. We humans love to compartmentalise things. We love to divide our education system into separate subjects, just as we love to divide our shared planet into nations and our books into genres. But the reality is that things are blurred. Just as being good at mathematics often means someone is good at physics, so having depression means it probably comes with other things. Anxieties, maybe some phobias, a pinch of OCD. Compulsive swallowing was a big thing with me. I also had agoraphobia and separation anxiety for a while. A measure of progress I had was how far I could walk on my own. If I was outside and I wasn't with Andrea or one of my parents, I wasn't able to cope. But rather than avoid these situations, I forced myself into them. I think this helped. It is quite gruelling, always facing fear and heading into it, but it seemed to work. On the days when I was feeling very brave, I would say something impossibly heroic, like I'm going to the shop to get some milk and Marmite. And Andrea would look at me and say, On your own? Yes, on my own. I'll be fine. And so I would hurriedly put on my coat and grab some money and leave the house as quickly as I could, trying to outpace the panic. And by the time I reached the end of Wellington Road, my parents' street, it would be there, the darkness, whispering at me. And I would turn the corner onto Sleaford Road, orange brick terraces with neck curtains. And I would feel a deep level of insecurity, like I was in a shuttle that was leaving the Earth's orbit. It wasn't simply a walk to the shop. It was Apollo 13. It's okay. I whispered to myself. The weirdness, that feeling of being outside alone, it was as unnatural as being a roof without walls. I would see the shop up ahead, the letters Londis still looking small and far away. So much sadness and fear to walk through. There is no way I can do this. There is no way I can walk to the shop on my own and find milk and Marmite. If you go back home, you'll be weaker still. If you go back, the chances of living forever in a padded cell with white walls is higher than it is already. Do it. Just walk to the shop. You've been walking to the corner shop on your own since you were ten. Then my heart kicked in. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. 
and the other things. The mind images, straight out of unmade horror films. The pins and needles sensation at the back of my head, then all through my brain. The numb hands and arms. The sense of being physically empty, of dissolving, of being a ghost whose existence was sourced by electric anxiety, and it became hard to breathe. The air thinned. It took massive concentration just to keep control of my breathing. I got to the shop. Shops, by the way, were the places I would panic in most, with or without Andrea. Was it the lighting? Was it the geometric layout of the aisles? Was it that the point of brands was to scream for attention, and when you were deeply in tune with your surroundings, maybe those screams got to you? A kind of death by Unilever. This was only Londis hardly a hypermarket, and the door was open. The street was right there, and that street joined onto my parents' street, which contained my parents' house, which contained Andrea, who contained everything. If I was running, I could probably get back there in little over a minute. I tried to focus. Cocoa Pops. It was hard. Frosties. Really hard. Sugar Puffs. The honey monster had never looked like an actual monster before. What was I in here for, other than to prove a point to myself? This is crazy. This is the craziest thing I have ever done. It's just a shop. It's just a shop you've been in, on your own, 500 times before. Get a grip. But on what? There is nothing to grip onto. Everything is slippy. Life is so infinitely hard. It involves a thousand tasks all at once. And I am a thousand people, all fleeing away from the centre. The thing I hadn't realised before I became mentally ill is the physical aspect of it. I mean, even the stuff that happens inside your head is all sensation. My brain tingled, whirred, uttered and pumped. Much of this action seemed to happen near the rear of my skull, in my occipital lobe though there was also some fuzzy, TV-static, white noise feelings going on in my frontal lobe. If you thought too much, maybe you could feel those thoughts happening. An infinity of passion can be contained in one minute, wrote Flaubert, like a crowd in a small space. Get out of this shop. It's too much. You can't take this anymore. Your brain is going to explode. Brains don't explode. Life isn't a David Cronenberg movie. But maybe I could fall the same distance again. Maybe the fall that happened in Ibiza had only landed me halfway. Maybe the actual underworld was much further down in the basement and I was heading there and I'd end up like a shell-shocked soldier from a poem, dribbling and howling and lost, unable even to kill myself. And maybe being in this shop was going to send me there. There was a woman behind the counter. I can still picture her. She was about my age. She was large and pale-skinned and was reading a celebrity magazine. She looked calmer than calm. I wanted to jump ship. I wanted to be her. Does that sound silly? Of course it does. This whole thing sounds silly. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Marmite. I found the Marmite. I grabbed it. I still had to get the milk. Rows of milk bottles in a fridge can be as terrifying and unnatural as anything with the right, wrong perspective. My parents got semi-skimmed, but the only semi-skimmed here was in pints, not the two-pint ones that they normally got. So I picked up two of the one-pinters, hooking my index fingers through the handles and taking them and the marmite to the counter. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. The woman I wanted to be was not particularly fast at her job. I think she may well have been the incentive for the later move towards self-service checkouts. Even as I wanted to be her, I hated her slowness. Hurry up. I didn't say. I wanted to go back and start my life again at her pace. And then I would not be feeling like this. I needed a slower run-up. Do you need a bag? I sort of did need a bag but I couldn't risk slowing her down any more. Standing still was very hard when every bit of you is panicking. Then walking is better than standing. Something flooded my brain. I closed my eyes. I saw dwarf demons having fun, 
laughing at me as if my madness was an act at a carnival. No, it's okay. I only live around the corner. Around the bend. I paid with a five pound note. Keep the change. And she started to realize I was a bit weird. And I left the shop and I was out, back into the vast and open world. And I kept walking as fast as I could walk, feeling like a fish on the deck of a boat, needing the water again. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I turned the corner and I prayed more than anything not to see someone I knew on Wellington Road. No one. Just emptiness and suburban, semi-detached, late Victorian houses lined up and staring at each other. And I got back to number 33, my parents' house, and I rang the bell. And Andrea answered, and I was inside, and there was no relief, because my mind was quick to point out that being relieved about surviving a trip to the corner shop was another confirmation of sickness, not wellness. You're getting there, said Andrea. Yeah, I said, and tried so hard to believe it. We're going to get you better. It's not easy being there for a depressive. A Conversation Across Time, part two. Then me. I can't do this. Now me. You think you can't, but you can. You do, you will. This pain though. You must have forgotten what it was like. I went on an escalator today in a shop and I felt myself disintegrating. It was like the whole universe was pulling me apart. Right there in John Lewis. I probably have forgotten a little bit, but listen, look, I'm here. I'm here now. And I made it. We made it. You just have to hold on. I so want to believe that you exist. That I don't kill you off. You didn't. You don't. You won't. Why would I stay alive? Wouldn't it be better to feel nothing than to feel such pain? Isn't zero worth more than minus one thousand? Listen, just listen. Just get this through your head, okay? You make it. And on the other side of this, there is life. L-I-F-E. Understand? And there will be stuff you enjoy. And just stop worrying about worrying. Just worry. You can't help that, but don't meta-worry. You look old. You have crow's feet. Are you starting to lose your hair? Yes, but remember, we've always worried about this stuff. Can you remember that holiday to the Dordogne when we were ten? We leaned forward into the mirror and started to worry about the lines in our forehead. We were worrying about the visible effects of ageing back then. Are you still scared of dying? Yes. I need a reason to stay alive. I need something strong that will keep me here. Okay. Okay, give me a minute. Reasons to stay alive. One. You are on another planet. No one understands what you're going through, but actually they do. You don't think they do because the only reference point is yourself. You have never felt this way before. And the shock of the descent is traumatizing you, but others have been here. You are in a dark, dark land with a population of millions. Two, things aren't going to get worse. You want to kill yourself. That is as low as it gets. There is only upwards from here. Three, you hate yourself. That is because you are sensitive. Pretty much every human could find a reason to hate themselves if they thought about it as much as you did. Four, so what, you have a label depressive. Everyone would have a label if they asked the right professional. Five, that feeling you have that everything is going to get worse is just a symptom. Six, minds have their own weather systems. You are in a hurricane. Hurricanes run out of energy eventually. Hold on. Seven, ignore stigma. Every illness had stigma once. We fear getting ill, and fear tends to lead to prejudice before information. 
Polio used to be erroneously blamed on poor people, for instance. 8. Nothing lasts forever. This pain won't last. The pain tells you it will last. Pain lies. Ignore it. Pain is a debt paid off with time. 9. Minds move. Personalities shift. To quote myself from the humans, your mind is a galaxy, more dark than light. But the light makes it worthwhile, which is to say, don't kill yourself. Even when the darkness is total, always know that life is not still. Time is space. You are moving through that galaxy. Wait for the stars. 10. You will one day experience joy that matches this pain. You will cry euphoric tears at the Beach Boys. You will stare down at a baby's face as she lies asleep in your lap. You will make great friends. You will eat delicious food you haven't tried yet. You will be able to look at a view from a high place and not assess the likelihood of dying from falling. There are books you haven't read yet that will enrich you. Films you will watch while eating extra large buckets of popcorn and you will dance and laugh and have sex and go for runs by the river and have late night conversations and laugh until it hurts. Life is waiting for you. You might be stuck here for a while, but the world isn't going anywhere. Hang on in there if you can. Life is always worth it. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 5 an inconsequential moment offers an unremarkable glimmer of hope for Matt. A stuttering journey towards recovery begins. It came. The moment I was waiting for. Sometime in April 2000, it was totally inconsequential. In fact, there is not much to write about. That was the whole point. It was a moment of nothingness, of absent-mindedness, of spending almost 10 seconds awake, but not actively thinking of my depression or anxiety. I was thinking about work, about trying to get an article published in a newspaper. It wasn't a happy thought, but a neutral one. But it was a break in the clouds, a sign that the sun was still there somewhere. It was over not much after it began, but when those clouds came back, there was hope. There would be a time when those painless seconds would become minutes and hours, and maybe even days. It's hard to explain depression to people who haven't suffered from it. It is like explaining life on Earth to an alien. The reference points just aren't there. You have to resort to metaphors. You are trapped in a tunnel. You are at the bottom of the ocean. You were on fire. The main thing is the intensity of it. It does not fit within the normal spectrum of emotions. When you are in it, you are really in it. You can't step outside it without stepping outside of life because it is life. Every single thing you experience is filtered through it. Consequently, it magnifies everything. At its most extreme, Things that an everyday normal person would hardly notice have overwhelming effects. The sun sinks behind a cloud, and you feel that slight change in weather as if a friend has died. You feel the difference between inside and outside as a baby feels the difference between womb and world. You swallow an ibuprofen and your neurotic brain acts like it has taken an overdose of methamphetamine. Depression for me wasn't a dulling, 
but a sharpening, an intensifying, as though I had been living my life in a shell, and now the shell wasn't there. It was total exposure, a red, raw, naked mind. What I didn't realise at the time, what would have seemed incomprehensible to me, was that this state of mind would end up having positive effects, as well as negative effects. I'm not talking about all that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger stuff. No, that's simply not true. What doesn't kill you very often makes you weaker. What doesn't kill you can make you scared to leave your house or even your bedroom and have you trembling or mumbling incoherently or leaning with your head on a window pane, wishing you could return to the time before the thing that didn't kill you. No, this isn't a question of strength. Not the stoic, get on with stuff without thinking too much kind of strength, anyway. It's more of a zooming in, that sharpening, that switch from the prosaic to the poetic. You know, before the age of 24, I hadn't known how bad things could feel, but I hadn't realised how good they could feel either. That shell might be protecting you, but it's also stopping you feeling the full force of that good stuff. Depression might be a hell of a price to pay for waking up to life, and while it is on top of you, it is one that could never seem worth paying. But it is quite therapeutic to know that pleasure doesn't just help compensate for pain. It can actually grow out of it. We spent three long months at my parents' house, then spent the rest of that winter in a cheap flat in a student area of Leeds, while Andrea did freelance PR work, and I tried not to go mad. But from, I suppose, April 2000, that good stuff started to become available. The bad stuff was still there. The good stuff probably amounted to about 0.0001% of that April. The good stuff was just warm sunshine on my face as Andrea and I walked from our flat in the suburbs to the city centre. It lasted as long as the sunshine was there, and then it disappeared. But from that point on, I knew it could be accessed. I knew life was available to me again. And so in May, 0.0001% became about 0.1%. I was rising. Then, at the start of June, we moved to a flat in the city centre. Light was everything. Sunshine, windows with the blinds open, pages with short chapters and lots of white space. Light was everything. But so increasingly were books. I read and read with an intensity I'd never really known before. I needed books. They weren't a luxury good during that time in my life. They were a Class A addictive substance. There is this idea that you either read to escape or you read to find yourself. I don't really see the difference. We find ourselves through the process of escaping. It is not where we are, but where we want to go and all that. Is there no way out of the mind? Sylvia Plath famously asked. I had been interested in this question ever since I had come across it as a teenager in a book of quotations. If there is a way out, a way that isn't death itself, then the exit route is through words. But rather than leave the mind entirely, words help us leave a mind and give us the building blocks to build another one, similar but better, nearby to the old one, but with firmer foundations, and very often, a better view. The object of art is to give life a shape, said Shakespeare, and my life, and my mess of a mind needed shape. I had lost the plot. There was no linear narrative of me. There was just mess and chaos. So yes, I loved external narratives for the hope they offered films, TV dramas, and most of all, books. They were, in and of themselves, reasons to stay alive. Every book written is the product of a human mind in a particular state. Add all the books together and you get the end sum of humanity. Every time I read a great book, I felt I was reading a kind of map, a treasure map. And the treasure I was being directed to was, in actual fact, myself. But each map was incomplete, and I would only locate the treasure if I read all the books. And so the process of finding my best self was an endless quest. And the books themselves seemed to me to reflect this idea. 
which is why the plot of every book ever can be boiled down to someone is looking for something. One cliché attached to bookish people is that they are lonely. But for me, books were my way out of being lonely. If you're the type of person who thinks too much about stuff, then there is nothing lonelier in the world than being surrounded by a load of people on a different wavelength. In my deepest state of depression, I had felt stuck. I felt trapped in quicksand. Books were about movement. They were about quests and journeys, beginnings and middles and ends, even if not in that order. They were about new chapters and leaving old ones behind. And because it was only a few months before that I had lost the point of words and stories and even language, I was determined never to feel like that again. I fed and I fed and I fed. She was about to tell me my birthday surprise. We're going to Paris tomorrow. We're going to Paris tomorrow. We're going to get the Eurostar. I was shell-shocked. I couldn't imagine anyone saying anything more terrifying. I can't. I can't go to Paris. It was happening. A panic attack. I was starting to feel it in my chest. I was starting to feel like I was back in 2000 mode, back in that feeling of being trapped inside myself like a desperate fly in a jar. Well, where we're going is going to be great. We're staying in the hotel Oscar Wilde died in. Lotel, it's called. Going to the place where Oscar Wilde died wasn't making it any better. It just guaranteed I was going to die there, to die in Paris just like Oscar Wilde. I also imagined the air would kill me. I hadn't been abroad for four years. I don't think I'll be able to breathe the air. I knew this sounded stupid. I wasn't mad, and yet the fact remained. I didn't think I'd be able to breathe the air. At some point after that, I was curled tight in a fetal ball behind the door. I was trembling. I don't know if anyone had been this scared of Paris since Marie Antoinette, but Andrea knew what to do. She had a PhD in this kind of thing by now. She said, OK, we won't go. I can cancel the hotel. We might lose a bit of money, but if it's such a big deal... Such a big deal. I could still hardly walk 20 metres on my own without having a panic attack. It was the biggest deal imaginable. It was like, I suppose, a normal person being told they had to walk naked around Tehran or something. But, if I said no, then I would be a person who couldn't travel abroad because he was scared. And that would make me like a mad person. And my biggest fear, bigger even than death, was of being totally mad. So, as was so often the case, a big fear was beaten by a bigger fear. And I went to Paris. The Channel Tunnel held together, and the sea didn't fall on our heads. The air in Paris worked OK with my lungs, though I could hardly speak in the taxi. The journey from Gare du Nord to the hotel was intense. There was some kind of march going on by the banks of the Seine, with a large red flag swooping like the tricolor in Les Miserables, when I closed my eyes that night, I couldn't sleep for hours because I kept seeing Paris moving at the speed it had moved by in the taxi. But I calmed. I didn't actually have a proper panic attack at any point during the next four days, just a generalised high anxiety that I felt walking around the left bank and along the Rue de Rivoli and in the restaurant on the roof of the Pompidou Centre. I was starting to find that, sometimes, simply doing something that I had dreaded and surviving was the best kind of therapy. If you start to dread being outside, go outside. If you fear confined spaces, spend some time in a lift. If you have separation anxiety, force yourself to be alone a while. When you're depressed and anxious, your comfort zone tends to shrink from the size of a world to the size of a bed, or right down to nothing at all. Another thing, stimulation, excitement, the kinds found in new places. Sometimes this can be terrifying, but it can also be liberating. In a familiar place, 
your mind focuses solely on itself. There is nothing new it needs to notice about your bedroom, no potential external threats, just internal ones. By forcing yourself into a new physical space, preferably in a different country, you end up inevitably focusing a bit more on the world outside your head. Well, that's how it worked for me, those few days in Paris. Travel makes one modest, said Gustave Flaubert. You see what a tiny place you occupy in the world. Such perspective can be strangely liberating, especially when you have an illness that may, on the one hand, lower self-esteem, but on the other, intensifies the trivial. I can remember, during a short depressive episode, watching Martin Scorsese's Howard Hughes biopic, The Aviator. There is a point in it where Catherine Hepburn, played rather brilliantly by Kate Blanchett, turns to Hughes, Leonardo DiCaprio, and says, There's too much Howard Hughes in Howard Hughes. It was this intensity of self that, in the film version of his life at least, was shown to contribute to the obsessive compulsive disorder that would eventually imprison Hughes in a hotel room in Las Vegas. Andrea told me after that film that there was too much Matt Haig in Matt Haig. She was kind of joking, but also kind of onto something. So for me, anything that lessens that extreme sense of self, that makes me feel me, but at a lower volume, is very welcome. And ever since that Paris trip, travel has been one of those things. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 6 Progress slowly continues for young Matt when he discovers that, to his surprise, he is even capable of being a supportive boyfriend. It was 2002. I was at that point in my recovery where I was continually feeling well, but only in contrast to the much worse stuff that had gone before. Really, I was still a walking mass of anxiety, too phobic to take medicine of any kind, and convinced my tongue was expanding every time I consumed prawns or peanut butter. I also needed to be near Andrea. If I was near Andrea, I was infinitely calmer than when I wasn't. In 2002, Andrea's mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. We went and stayed with her parents in County Durham, while Frieda underwent chemotherapy. Andrea, who had spent the last three years fixing a depressive boyfriend, now had a mother with cancer. This was my turn to be the strong one. When she first found out her mum was ill, she sat on the edge of the bed and cried like I had never seen her cry. I put my arm around her and felt that sudden shrinking of language you feel when something terrible happens. Fortunately, Andrea was on hand to help. Just say it's going to be okay, she said. It's going to be okay. Two months later, I was alone in the house of my future in-laws, pleading with Andrea to go with them to the hospital. I've got to take Mum to hospital, she had said. Okay, I'll come with you. They want someone to wait and let David in. David was Andrea's brother, travelling up from London. I can come with you. Matt, please. I can't do this. Separation anxiety. I'll have a panic attack. Matt, I'm asking you. My mum's ill. I don't want to stress her out. You're being selfish. Shit, I'm sorry, but you don't understand. You can do this. I won't make it. Can't you just tell your mum and dad I've got to come too? Okay, all right, okay. I will. But then it happened. A switch flicked. No. No what? I'll do it. 
I'll stay. I'll stay in the house. Really? Yeah. I'll leave the number for the hospital. It's okay. I said, stupidly imagining these could be my last ever words to her. I could find it. I'll leave it anyway. Thank you. It's okay. You'd better go. While waiting for them to come home with Andrea from the hospital, I paced from room to room. They had lots of porcelain ornaments, little Bo Peep, a pink panther sitting cross-legged, his legs hanging down off the window sill. His wide, yellow eyes followed me around the living room. The first ten minutes, my heart was pounding. I could hardly breathe. Andrea was dead. Her parents were dead. I was picturing the car crash too vividly for it not to have happened. Then twenty minutes passed. I was going to die. There was a pain in my chest. Maybe it was lung cancer. I was only twenty-seven, but I had smoked a lot. At thirty minutes, a neighbour came around to see how Frida was. At forty minutes, the adrenaline was starting to settle. I had been forty minutes on my own, and I was still alive. By fifty minutes, I actually wanted them to be gone over an hour so that I could feel even stronger. Fifty minutes. Three years of separation anxiety cured in less than an hour. Needless to say, they came back. It was a horrible summer, but the outcome was okay. Andrea's mother was given terrible odds, but she beat them. I had reasons to force myself to be strong, to put myself in situations I wouldn't have put myself in. You need to be uncomfortable. You need to hurt. Also, I channeled my mind by writing my first proper novel. Not principally for career reasons. The novel was a reworking of Henry IV with talking dogs, so hardly bestseller territory. But to occupy myself. Two years later, though, and with Andrea's encouragement, it would be an actual published book. I dedicated the book to Andrea, obviously, but it wasn't just a book I owed her. It was a whole life. My agent. You've got a publisher. What? Just had the phone call. You are going to be a published author. What? Seriously? Seriously. This news kept me going for about six months. For about six months, my lack of self-esteem had been artificially addressed. I would lie in bed and go to sleep smiling. But being published or getting a great job or whatever does not permanently alter your brain. And one night I lay awake feeling less than happy. I started to worry. The worries spiralled. And for three weeks, I was trapped in my own mind again. But this time I had weapons. One of them, maybe the most important, was this knowledge. I have been ill before, then well again. Wellness is possible. Another weapon was running. Running is a commonly cited alleviator of depression and anxiety. When I started running, I was still getting very bad panic attacks. The thing I liked about it was that many of the physical symptoms of panic, the racing heart, the problematic breathing, the sweating, are matched by running. So while I was running, I wouldn't be worried about my racing heart because it had a reason to be racing. Also, it gave me something to think about. I was never exactly the fittest person in the world, so running was quite difficult. It hurt, but that effort and discomfort was a great focuser. And so I convinced myself that through training my body, I was also training my mind. It was a kind of active meditation. It also, of course, gets you fit, and getting fit is pretty much good for everything. So every day I would go running, or do an equivalent type of cardiovascular exercise. Like Haruki Murakami, whose excellent book What I Talk About When I Talk About Running I would later read, I found running to be a way of clearing the fog. I would come back from a run and stretch and have a shower and feel a gentle sense of release, as though depression and anxiety were slowly evaporating from inside me. It was a wonderful feeling. Also, that kind of monotony that running generates, the one soundtracked by heavy breathing and the steady rhythm of feet on pavements, became a kind of metaphor for depression. 
To go on a run every day is to have a kind of battle with yourself. Just getting out on a cold February morning gives you a sense of achievement. But that voiceless debate you have with yourself, I want to stop, no, keep going, I can't, I can hardly breathe, there's only a mile to go, I just need to lie down, you can't, is the debate of depression. But on a smaller and less serious scale. So for me, each time I force myself out there in the cold, grey damp of a West Yorkshire morning, it gave me a little bit of depression-beating power. It helped, sometimes. Not always. It wasn't foolproof. I wasn't Zeus. There were no magic thunderbolts at my disposal. But it is nice to build up, over the years, things that you know do, on occasion, work. Weapons for the war that subsides, but that can always ignite again. Abraham Lincoln, when he was 32, declared, I am now the most miserable man living. He had, by that age, experienced two massive depressive breakdowns. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. Yet, of course, while Lincoln openly declared he had no fear of suicide, he did not kill himself. He chose to live. He was evidently a serious person, one of the great serious people of history. He fought mental wars and physical ones. Maybe his knowledge of suffering led to the kind of empathy he showed when seeking to change the law on slavery. Wherever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally, he said. Lincoln is not the only famous leader to have battled depression. Winston Churchill lived with the black dog for much of his life too. Sometimes the links between depression, anxiety and productivity are undeniable. Think of Edvard Munch's omnipresent painting The Scream, for instance. Not only is this a most accurate visual depiction of what a panic attack feels like, but it was also, according to the artist himself, directly inspired by a moment of existential terror. But even without the smoking gun of a specific depressive episode inspiring a specific work of genius, it is impossible to ignore the sheer number of greats who have battled depression. Even without focusing on the Plaths and Hemingways and Wolfs who actually killed themselves, the list of known depressives is staggering. And many times there is a link between the illness and the work they produce. People often use the word despite in the context of mental illness. So-and-so did such-and-such such, despite having depression, anxiety, OCD, agoraphobia, whatever. But sometimes that despite should be a uh, because. For instance, I write because of depression. I was not a writer before. The intensity needed to explore things with relentless curiosity and energy simply wasn't there. Fear makes us curious. Sadness makes us philosophize. To be or not to be is a daily question for many depressives. Going back to Abraham Lincoln, the key thing to note is that the president always suffered with depression. He never fully overcame it. But he lived alongside it and achieved great things. So, even if depression is not totally overcome, we can learn to use what the poet Byron called a fearful gift. We don't have to use it to rule a nation like Churchill or Lincoln. We don't even have to use it to paint a really good picture. We can just use it in life. For instance, I find that being grimly aware of mortality can make me steadfastly determined to enjoy life where life can be enjoyed. It makes me value precious moments with my children and with the woman I love. It adds intensity in bad ways, but also good ways. Art and political vigour are just one spillover of that intensity, but it can manifest itself in a million other ways, most of which won't make you famous, but many of which will, in the long term, add as well as take away. A Conversation Across Time, Part 3
then me. It's terrifying. Now me. What is? Life. My mind. The weight of it. Shh, stop that. You're just a bit trapped inside a moment. The moment will change. Andrea will leave me. No, no she won't. Huh. She'll marry you. As if anyone would tie themselves to a useless freak like me. Would they? Yes. And look, you're making progress. You go to the shop now and you don't have a panic attack. You don't feel that weight on you all the time. I do. No. There was that time last week when I... when you were out in the sunshine walking through the park and you felt a lightness. A moment you weren't really thinking. Actually, yes. Yes, that's true. I had another this morning. I was lying in bed just wondering if we had any cereal left. That was it. It was just a normal thing, and it lasted over a minute. Just lying there, thinking about breakfast. See? So you know things aren't always going to be the same. I mean, things today weren't always the same. But it's still so intense. And it always will be. You will always be quite intense, and the depression might always be there, waiting for the next fall. But there is so much life waiting for you. The one thing depression has told you is that a day can be a long and intense stretch of time. Oh, God, yes. Well then, don't worry about the passing of time. There can be infinity inside a day. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Hamlet. Impressive. I've forgotten all those lines by now. It's been a long time since university. I am starting to believe in you. Thank you. I mean, th the possibility of you. The possibility that I exist more than a decade in the future. And that I feel a lot better. It's true. You do. And you have a family of your own. You have a life. It's not perfect. No human life is. But it is yours. I want proof. I can't prove it. There is no time machine. No. I suppose I'll just have to hope. Yes, have faith. I'll try. You already have. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop. Episode 7. Matt realises that sometimes there is good reason in the modern world to panic. But he learns too that the only constant is change. Living. The world is increasingly designed to depress us. Happiness isn't very good for the economy. If we were happy with what we had, why would we need more? How do you sell an anti-aging moisturiser? You make someone worry about ageing. How do you get people to vote for a political party? You make them worry about immigration. How do you get them to buy a new smartphone? By making them feel like they are being left behind. To be calm becomes a kind of revolutionary act. To be happy with your own non-upgraded existence, to be comfortable with our messy human selves, would not be good for business. Yet we have no other world to live in. And actually, when we really look closely, the world of stuff and advertising is not really life. Life is the other stuff. Life is what is left when you take all that crap away, or at least ignore it for a while. 
Life is the people who love you. No one will ever choose to stay alive for an iPhone. It's the people we reach via the iPhone that matter. And once we begin to recover and to live again, we do so with new eyes. Things become clearer and we are aware of things we weren't aware of before. I never saw the double whammy of anxiety and depression coming before it knocked me out when I was 24, but I should have done. The warning signs were all there. The moments of despair as a teenager, the continual worrying about everything. In particular, I believe there were a lot of warning signs while I was a student at Hull University. I used to feel slightly strange sometimes, blurred around the edges as if I was a walking watercolour, and I did need to drink a lot of alcohol, now I think about it. I also had what was a panic attack, though not on the scale of the later ones. Here is what happened. As part of my degree, I took a module on art history. Though I didn't realise it at the time, that meant I would have to do a presentation on a modern art movement. I chose Cubism. It sounds like nothing, but I was dreading it as much as you could dread anything. I had always been scared of performing and public speaking, but this was something else. The thing that I was particularly worried about was the fact that I had to coordinate reading my words with the presenting of slides. What if I put the slides in upside down? What if I spoke about Juan Gris' portrait of Picasso while actually showing a Picasso? There were a seemingly infinite number of nightmare possibilities. Fittingly, given the subject of the talk was an art movement that involved abandoning perspective, I was losing perspective. The day came. Tuesday the 17th of March 1997. It looked like so many other drab hull days, but it wasn't. There was threat in the air. Everything, even the furniture in our student house, looked like secret weapons in an invisible war against me. You could always pretend to be ill, Andrea said. No, I can't. It's assessed. Jesus, Matt, calm down. You've turned this into something it's not. And then I went to the chemist and bought a pack of Natricalm and swallowed as many of the tablets as I could manage. I waited to feel the calm that was promised, but it didn't happen. Itching happened, and then a rash happened. The rash was all over my neck and hands, angry red blotches. The seminar wasn't until quarter past two. Maybe the rash was a stress response. Maybe I needed something else to calm me down. I went to the union bar and had a pint of lager and two vodka and limes. I had a cigarette. With ten minutes to go before the presentation was due to begin, I was in the toilets in the history department, staring at a swastika some idiot had by road onto the shining blonde wood of the door. My neck was getting worse. I stayed in the toilets, silently briefing myself in the mirror. I did the presentation. I stuttered and messed up the slides a couple of times and failed to say anything at all that I didn't have written down in front of me in my best handwriting. People didn't giggle at my rash. They just looked deeply uncomfortable. But halfway through, I became detached from myself. I de-realized. The string that holds on to that feeling of selfhood was cut, and it floated away like a helium balloon. I was there, not exactly above myself, but above and beside and everywhere all at once, watching and hearing myself in a state of such heightened self-consciousness, I'd actually burst right out of myself altogether. It was, I suppose, a panic attack. My first actual proper one, though nowhere near the scale of those I'd know later. It should have been a warning sign. But it wasn't because I had been panicking for a reason. Okay, so it wasn't much of one, but in my head it was. And if you're having a panic attack for a reason, a lion is chasing you, the lift door won't open, you don't know how to pronounce chiaroscuro, then it is not really a panic attack, but a logical response to a fearful situation. To panic without a reason, that's madness. To panic with a reason, that's sanity. I was still on the right side of the line. Just. But it is always hard for us to see the future inside the present, even when it is right there in front of us. Anxiety, even more than depression, can be exacerbated by the way we live in the 21st century, by the things that surround us smartphones, advertising. I think of a great David Foster Wallace line, 
it did what all ads are supposed to do, create an anxiety relievable by purchase. Facebook likes, Instagram, unanswered emails, dating apps, war, the changing climate, overcrowded public transport, Google-induced hypochondria, constant distraction, work, 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 24-hour everything. Maybe to be truly in tune with the modern world means anxiety is inevitable. But here we must again distinguish between anxiety and anxiety with a capital A. For instance, I was an anxious person. As a child, I used to worry about death a lot, certainly more than a child should. I also used to climb into my parents' bed and tell them I was too scared to go to sleep in case I woke up without the ability to see or hear. I even cried once when I was 14 about the fact that music wasn't as good as it had been when I was little. I was a sensitive child, it's fair to say. But anxiety proper, generalized anxiety disorder and the related panic disorder that I was diagnosed with too, can be a desperate thing. It can be a full-time occupation of gale force worry. That said, from my personal experience, anxiety, even more than depression, is very treatable. There does seem to be one thing that works across the board to a greater or lesser degree, namely slowing down. Anxiety runs your mind at fast forward rather than normal play speed. So addressing that issue of mental pace might not be easy, but it works. Anxiety takes away all the commas and full stops we need to make sense of ourselves. Here are some ways to add back that mental punctuation. Yoga. I was a yoga phobe, but am now a convert. It's great because unlike other therapies, it treats the mind and the body as part of the same whole. Slow your breathing. Not crazy deep breaths, just gentle. In for five, out for five. It's hard to stick to, but it is very hard for panic to happen if your breathing is relaxed. So many anxiety symptoms, dizziness, pins and needles, tingling, are directly related to shallow breathing. Meditate. You don't have to chant. Just sit down for five minutes and try to think of a single calming thing. A boat moored in a glittering sea. The face of someone you love. Accept. Don't fight things. Feel them. Tension is about opposition. Relaxation is about letting go. Live in the present. Love. Love is an outward force. It is our road out of our own terrors, because anxiety is an illness that wraps us up in our own nightmares. This is not selfishness, even though people read it as such. If your leg is on fire, it is not selfish to concentrate on the pain or the fear of the flames. So it is with anxiety. People with mental illness aren't wrapped up in themselves because they are intrinsically any more selfish than other people. Of course not. They are just feelings that can't be ignored. Things that point the arrows inward. But having people who love you and who you love is such a help. This doesn't have to be romantic or even familial love. Forcing yourself to see the world through love's gaze can be healthy. Love is an attitude to life. It can save us. For ten years of my life, I could not go to a party without being terrified. Yes, here was me who had worked in Ibiza for the largest and wildest weekly party in Europe, unable to step into a room full of happy people holding wine glasses without having a panic attack. Shortly after I became published, and was worried that I would soon be dropped. I felt obliged to attend a literary Christmas party. I was sober, as I was still petrified of alcohol, and I headed into a room and instantly felt out of my depth as famous brainy people, Zadie Smith, David Baddiel, Graham Swift, seemed to be everywhere with their famous brainy faces totally in their element. Of course, it is never easy walking into a room full of people, there is that awkward moment of hovering around like a serious, lonely molecule while everyone else is in their tight little circles, all laughter and conversation. I stood in the middle of the room, looking for someone I knew for reasons other than that they were famous, and couldn't see anyone. 
I held my glass of sparkling mineral water. I was too scared of caffeine and sugar to have anything else. And tried to think my discomfort made me a genius. For a couple of seconds, I kind of accidentally locked eyes with Zadie Smith. She turned away. She was clearly thinking I was a weirdo. The queen of literature thinks I am a weirdo. As I stood there, those bubbles of carbon dioxide rose in my glass. I felt a kind of annihilation. I began to be not entirely sure I was there at all. And I felt floaty. This was it. A relapse. Weeks, maybe months of depression awaited me. Breathe. I told myself, just breathe. I needed Andrea. The air was getting thinner. I was in the zone. I had passed the event horizon. It was no good. I was lost in a black hole of my own making. I put my glass down on the table and got out of there. I left a coat in the cloakroom that could still be there for all I know. I stepped into the London night and ran back the short distance to the cafe where Andrea, my eternal saviour, waited for me. What's the matter? She asked. I thought you were going to be an hour. I couldn't. I needed to get out of there. Well, you're out. How do you feel? I thought about this. How did I feel? Like an idiot, obviously. But also my panic attack had gone. In the old days, my panic attacks didn't just go. They simply morphed into more panic attacks, breaking me down like an army until depression could come in and colonise my head. But no, I was feeling quite normal again. A normal person who was allergic to parties. I had wanted to die in the party, but not literally. Really, I had just wanted to escape the room. But I had at least walked into the room in the first place. That itself was progress. A year later, I would be better enough to not only go to the party, but to travel there on my own. Sometimes on the rocky, windy path of recovery, what feels like failure can be a step forward. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig Read by Carl Prekop Episode 8 in this final instalment, Matt reflects on his journey with mental illness and finds contentment in the small but infinitely important things in life. Being. I have a thin skin. I think this is part and parcel of depression and anxiety, or to be precise, being a person quite likely to get depression and anxiety. I also think that I will never fully get over my breakdown 14 years ago. If the stone falls hard enough, the ripples last a lifetime. I have gone from never feeling happy to feeling happy, or at least somewhere in the ballpark, most of the time, so I am lucky. But I have blips. Either blips when I am genuinely depressed slash anxious, or blips caused by me fighting the onset of depression slash anxiety by doing something stupid like getting excessively drunk and coming home at five in the morning after losing my wallet and having to plead with a taxi driver to take me home. But generally, day to day, I don't fight it. I accept things more. This is who I am. And besides, fighting it actually makes it worse. The trick is to befriend depression and anxiety, to be thankful for them, because then you can deal with them a whole lot better. And the way I've befriended them is by thanking them for my thin skin. Sure, without a thin skin, I would never have known those terrible days of nothingness, those days of either panic 
or intense bone-scorching lethargy. The days of self-hate or drowning under invisible waves. I sometimes felt in my self-pity too fragile for a world of speed and right angles and noise. I love Jonathan Rottenberg's evolutionary theory of depression, that it is to do with being unable to adapt to the present. An ancient mood system has collided with a highly novel operating environment created by a remarkable species. But would I go along to a magical mind spa and ask for a skin thickening treatment? Probably not. You'd need to feel life's terror to feel its wonder. And I feel it today, actually right now, on what could seem like quite a grey overcast afternoon. I feel the sheer unfathomable marvel that is this strange life we have here on Earth, the seven billion of us clustered in our towns and cities on this pale blue dot of a planet, spending our allotted 30,000 days as best we can in glorious insignificance. I like to feel the force of that miracle. I like to burrow deep into this life and explore it through the magic of words and the magic of human beings and the magic of peanut butter sandwiches. And I'm glad to feel every tumultuous second of it. And glad for the fact that when I walk into the vast room with all the Tintorettos in it in the National Gallery, my skin literally tingles and my heart palpitates. And I am glad for the synesthesia that means when I read Emily Dickinson or Mark Twain, my mind feels actual warmth from those old American words. Feeling. That is what it's about. People place so much value on thought, but feeling is as essential. I want to read books that make me laugh and cry and fear and hope and punch the air in triumph. I want a book to hug me or grab me by the scruff of the neck. I don't even mind if it punches me in the gut because we are here to feel. I want life. I want to read it and write it and feel it and live it. I want, for as much of the time as possible in this blink of an eye existence we have, to feel all that can be felt. I hate depression. I'm scared of it. Terrified, in fact. But at the same time, it has made me who I am. And if, for me, it is the price of feeling life, it's a price always worth paying. I am satisfied just to be. Time troubles us. It is because of time that we grow old, and because of time we die. These are worrying things. As Aristotle put it, time crumbles things. And we are scared of our own crumbling and the crumbling of others. We feel an urgency to get on because time is short, to just do it, as Nike said. But is doing the answer? Or does doing actually speed up time? Wouldn't it be better just to be, even if less sporty footwear ends up being sold? Time does go at different speeds. As I've said, the few months in 1999 and 2000, when I was deeply ill, felt like years, decades even. Pain lengthens time. But that is only because pain forces us to be aware of it. Being aware of other things also helps lengthen time. This is all meditation is. Awareness of ourselves in the amber of the moment, to use Kurt Vonnegut's term. It sounds easy, but how much of our lives are we actually living in the present? How much instead are we either excited or worrying about the future, or regretting or mourning the past? Our response to all this worry about time is to try and achieve things before it is too late gain money, improve our status, marry, have children, get a promotion, gain more money, on and on, forever, or rather, not forever. If it were forever, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But we kind of know that turning life into a desperate race for more stuff is only going to shorten it. Not in years, not in terms of actual time, but in terms of how time feels. Imagine all the time we had was bottled up like wine and handed over to us. 
how would we make that bottle last? By sipping slowly, appreciating the taste, or by gulping? In the old days, before the breakdown, I used to deal with worry by distracting myself, by going out to clubs, by drinking heavily, by spending summers in Ibiza, by wanting the spiciest food, the brashest movies, the edgiest novels, the loudest music, the latest nights. I was scared of the quiet. I was scared, I suppose, of having to slow down and soften the volume. Scared of having nothing but my own mind to listen to. But after I became ill, all of this was suddenly out of bounds. I once switched on the radio and heard pounding house music and it gave me a panic attack. If I ate a Jalfrezi, I would lie in bed that night hallucinating and palpitating. People talk about using alcohol and drugs to self-medicate. And I would have loved to dull my senses. I would have taken crack if I thought it would help me ignore the hurricane in my head. But from the age of 24 to 32, I didn't have so much as a single glass of wine. Not because I was strong, as my teetotal future mother-in-law always thought I was but because I was petrified of anything that would alter my mind. But this was a good thing. It meant I had to focus on my mind. Like in an old horror movie, I was pulling back the curtain and seeing the monster. Years later, I would read books on mindfulness and meditation and realize that the key to happiness, or that even more desired thing, calmness, lies not in always thinking happy thoughts, no, that is impossible. No mind on earth with any kind of intelligence could spend a lifetime enjoying only happy thoughts. The key is in accepting your thoughts, all of them, even the bad ones. Accept thoughts, but don't become them. Understand, for instance, that having a sad thought, even having a continual succession of sad thoughts, is not the same as being a sad person. You can walk through a storm and feel the wind, but you know you are not the wind. That is how we must be with our minds. We must allow ourselves to feel their gales and downpours, but all the time knowing this is just necessary weather. When I sink deep now, and I still do from time to time, I try and understand that there is another, bigger and stronger part of me that is not sinking. It stands unwavering. It is, I suppose, the part that would have been once called my soul. We don't have to call it that if we think it has too many connotations. We can call it simply a self. Let's just understand this. If we are tired or hungry or hungover, we are likely to be in a bad mood. That bad mood is therefore not really us. To believe in the things we feel at that point is wrong because those feelings would disappear with food or sleep. But when I was at my lowest point, I touched something solid, something hard and strong at the core of me, something imperishable, immune to the changeability of thought. The self that is not only I, but also we. The self that connects me to you and human to human, the hard, unbreakable force of survival, of life, of the 150,000 generations of us that have gone before and of those yet to be born, our human essence. Just as the ground below New York and, say, Lagos becomes identical if you go down far enough beneath the Earth's surface, so every human inhabitant on this freak wonder of a planet shares the same core. I am you, and you are me. We are alone, but not alone. We are trapped by time, but also infinite. Made of flesh, but also stars. I went back to visit my parents in Newark about a month ago. They don't live in the same house, but the street they're on is parallel to the street where we used to live. It is a five minute walk. The corner shop is still there. I walk there on my own 
and bought a newspaper and could happily wait for the shopkeeper to give me my change. The houses I passed were the same orange brick houses. Nothing much had changed. Nothing makes you feel smaller, more trivial than such a vast transformation inside your own mind while the world carries on oblivious. Yet nothing is more freeing to accept your smallness in the world. Things I have enjoyed since the time I thought I would never enjoy anything again. Sunrises, sunsets, books, cold beer, fresh air, yellowing paperbacks, skin against skin at one in the morning, cold swimming pools, oceans, seas, rivers, lakes, fjords, ponds, puddles, roaring fires, pub meals, sitting outside and eating olives, the lights fading in the cinema with a bucket of warm popcorn in your lap, unabashed emotion, peanut butter sandwiches, the scent of pine on a warm evening in Italy, drinking water after a long run, getting the all clear after a health scare, Will Ferrell in Elf, talking to the person who knows me best, pigeon pose, picnics, boat rides, watching my son being born, catching my daughter in the water during her first three seconds, reading the tiger who came to tea and doing the tiger's voice, talking politics with my parents, talking heads, talking online about depression for the first time and getting a good response. Kanye West's first album, I know, I know. The Beach Boys, Lists, sitting on a bench in the park on a sunny day, meeting writers I love, foreign roads, rum cocktails, watching every Hitchcock movie, cities twinkling at night as you drive past them as if they are fallen constellations of stars. Laughing, yes, laughing so hard it hurts. Laughing as you bend forward and as your abdomen actually starts to hurt from so much pleasure, so much release. And then as you sit back and audibly groan and inhale deeply, staring at the person next to you mopping up the joy. Reading a new Jeff Dyer book. Reading an old Graham Greene book. Running down hills. Christmas trees. Painting the walls of a new house. White wine. Vanilla fudge. Wasabi peas. My children's terrible jokes. Watching geese and goslings on the river. Reaching an age I never thought I'd reach. Talking to friends. Talking to strangers. Talking to you. Writing this book. feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig The book came out in um, 2015. I 
had no idea how it was going to be received. It was basically the first time I'd properly, publicly talked or written about uh, my own experience of mental health issues. I, I wrote it because I felt compelled to. I certainly didn't think it would be a big successful book in terms of sales or anything like that. And it just naturally sort of took off in a very nice, organic kind of way through word of mouth. And then slowly it grew and grew and grew. And it was a, a lovely feeling, although it was quite an unsettling feeling. You know, because I'm not a doctor, because I'm not a neuroscientist or a psychologist, I, I felt a little scared of this new position where people were coming to me and asking about their uh, mental health issues and feeling suicidal. And, and I struggled for a while about how to cope with all that. I was getting a lot, a lot of messages on Instagram, on Twitter, via email. And that, for me, was quite probably the most overwhelming part of it all really and it took me a while to actually appreciate that I didn't have to be an expert or have every single answer to every person's problem I was just a person who had gone through something who got out of a situation he thought he'd never be able to get out of into a better situation and the other surprise was actually a lot of the people who read the book and who still read the book aren't people who themselves have been suicidal or had depression or anxiety or any other related mental health condition. It's often people who just want to know more about it because someone they know or care for is in a similar situation. So it gives a window on something that was formerly invisible. I think the reason I wrote it in a weird way was to sort of find my people, to find people who'd been through something similar, that who I, I didn't necessarily know in real life. When I became ill with, well, when I had a breakdown and had full-blown panic disorder and depression, I thought, stupidly, as I say in the book, I felt like I was the only person to have ever experienced what I was feeling because I'd never heard anyone talk about it. So I think I wanted from the outset to actually make it a kind of collective thing that like, yes this is very much my personal individual experience but it's also a universal experience mental health is something we all have even if we're not all mentally ill and the way mental illness feels even though it's specific from person to person has some common aspects and one of those common aspects i think is that feeling of being isolated and being alone and i think one of the reasons why therapy is important but also writing is important and reading about these things is important is it gives us that feeling of it being a problem shared, it being uh, less alone. As soon as we turn something into words and into language, it becomes something that's slightly outside of ourselves as well as inside of ourselves. And so what I wanted to do was actually start a conversation. So the book is actually written, a lot of it is written in a very sort of accessible, conversational way, and that's very deliberate. I mean, I'm writing to people to start a conversation. Uh, but beyond that, I, I think the ultimate reader, the person I had in mind, this sounds really sort of self-indulgent, but the person I had in mind was myself when I was younger, when I was 24, when I was, didn't think I could get through another day, another hour sometimes. I was writing to that person to try and see if there was a way of sort of hacking into that kind of mind to, to give a broader perspective about time and hope and the future and to sort of reassure that person. One of the most therapeutic things for me was to realise that when I came off social media for a while, not only did I not miss it, but people didn't miss me as much as I wanted them to. And so although I am a great fan of social media in terms of being able to expose and explore problems and to be able to find like-minded people, it's also important when things aren't going that well to realise that it's not the be-all and end-all, you know. I, I used to be very, very sensitive. Actually, around the time Reasons to Stay Alive was written, you know, I'd say the wrong thing online and or people would misunderstand what I said about a certain topic, often, you know, a mental health-related topic because there's all sorts of heated areas there, you know, about prescription drugs or your own experience of them. And all kinds of things can become volatile topics. And those negative voices used to get in. But in a way, it's a bit like handling mental health itself and mental illness itself you kind of just have to um, accept all these things and realize you don't have control you don't go into that situation with total control and that people are going to 
exactly act the way you want them to or respond the way you want them to. And there's something quite freeing about that. You know, happiness is never going to be um, there if we're constantly awaiting it externally from social media likes and interactions and people saying the right things about us. We have to find it in ourselves and never sort of seek it um, digitally. You know, this time has been extremely anxious because it's been full of uncertainty and uncertainty about the future is pretty much, you know, you, you last various philosophers and psychiatrists over the decades and it comes back to uncertainty. You know, that's why we feel fear in the first place. It's always about uncertainty. But the thing is, you know, this year hasn't fundamentally changed that. Our lives are always uncertain. The future itself is always something we don't know. We can never actually fully touch or taste or feel the future. It's always an abstract concept. So it's going back to that mindful thing of being truly in the present and accepting the present is always the only thing we know because by the time we reach the future that's another present in itself. So it's about, I think the answer to that is concentrating on the things around you, whether that's people, whether that's what you're choosing to watch or listen to, um, concentrate on looking after people, um, maybe phoning someone that you've been meaning to phone for a while. The answer is normally actually by doing something within the present and actually, you know, tuning into the present rather than worrying in the abstract about things we, we simply don't know about in the future. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066 BBC Sounds Music Radio Podcasts Hi, I'm Joe Wicks and I'm just popping up to tell you about my brand new podcast with BBC Radio 4. It's extraordinary. It almost turbocharges you. I'm really interested in the links between physical and mental health and what kind of ordinary, everyday activities people do to keep on top of things. I keep fit because it's relaxing, because it absolutely relaxes my mind. And that's so important. So in this podcast, I'm having a chat with some of my favourite people to find out their tips and tricks to staying healthy and happy. For me, it's a full body experience and it's a total game changer. I think you're going to love it. Hit subscribe on the Joe Wicks podcast on BBC Sounds. Let's do this.